Yes, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are listening from and when you are listening. Welcome to yet another episode of Discover Together, the incoming podcast. As you would have gotten tired of me saying, <laughs> we are still on our series, Types and Shadows, examining chronicling, scrutinizing, and analyzing how much Old Testament characters mirror the ultimate cornerstone of the entirety of scriptures and the Christian faith, Jesus Christ. We look at Joshua today. And Joshua mirrors Christ in, well, it it can be argued a number of ways, but we will look at three main ways. First of all, that name, Joshua. Why is the name significant? It's because the name is Yeshua. And what does it mean? Jehovah is salvation. And that name is essentially the name Jesus because Jesus also means Jehovah is salvation so if you look at Hebrews 4 for example in the old King James version you are going to scratch your head a bit because it says if Joshua had given them if Jesus had given them rest Hebrews 4 verse 8 if Jesus had given them rest he would not have spoken of another day and then you go if Jesus had given them rest are you saying Jesus did not give people rest but on the other hand if you look at more modern translations you will see it says if joshua had given them rest it's because jesus and joshua are variants of the same name so jesus is the greek greek equivalent i mean technically the greek equivalent is jesus because i don't believe there is j in the greek language but it's essentially the same name as Jesus. It's not a coincidence or just mere wordplay the fact that these two men have the same name, the same name. They also have a similar mission. Remember, Joshua's mission was to complete the Exodus. As we said earlier, Moses had done the bringing them out bit. But it took Joshua to do the bringing them in bit. So it was Joshua's mission to usher Israel into the promised land. And that journey is a picture of salvation. Because when you look at Hebrews 4, well, Hebrews 3 and 4, you begin to understand that the whole Israelite journey is a type of the gospel. Is a foreshadow of the gospel. So that's why that promise of rest, that promise of entry into the promised land, by the time you go to Hebrews 4 and 2, 4 verse 2 is equated to the gospel. It says, Indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Who is the them? The Israelites in the wilderness. He said, But the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it.
So it caused their failure to believe a hardening of the heart. And by the time you get to Hebrews 10, you are going to see that hardening of the heart there is a rejection of the gospel. So it's comparing the wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness, their entire journey, to salvation, to the gospel. And the promised land is representative of the rest that God promised the Israelites. So it follows, there is a lot to be gleaned from the mission of Joshua. regarding our salvation so first things first it took believing just the way you have to believe that God raised Christ from the dead to be a partaker of the gospel it took them believing that God had committed the land unto them as a matter of fact in proper context there is talking about in proper context in Hebrews 3 and 4 he's talking about what happened in Kadesh Barnea I believe it was when they sent out spies and only Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report and it caused the failure of their failure to move into the promised land you know, a hardening of the heart. So you see, just like the Kadesh Barnea incident, salvation as well, you know, it's the finished work of God, but it takes our believing to access it. In this promised land narrative, we also see something interesting. God had promised them this land, yet it had to be conquered. They had to fight wars. It didn't come easy. What is the lesson there? Now remember... that salvation is by grace through faith it's something only God can do and that's why when the disciples asked Jesus if this is the case who then can be saved Jesus said with men this is impossible but the things that are impossible with men are possible with God so humanly speaking salvation is impossible there is nothing a human being can do to attain salvation just the way there was nothing the Israelites could do to bring themselves out of Egypt there is nothing the Israelites could do to sustain themselves in the wilderness God was their guide in a pillar of fire by night in a pillar of cloud by day God was their sustenance he fed them with quails and with manna from heaven and ultimately he was the one that gave them victory in the promised land But despite this, God was very clear to them that, look, the victory they were going to get in the promised land was his victory and they should not let their hearts be lifted up as a result. Why do I emphasize this? Because salvation is by grace through faith. 
But by the time you get to the book of James, you now start seeing something that looks like a conflict when he says faith without works is dead. But as Charles Spurgeon puts it, doctrine of salvation by faith, doctrine of faith without works is dead. There's no need to reconcile them because you don't reconcile friends. Those doctrines are friends, not enemies. If you believe, your works will reflect what you believe. If you believe, what you do will reflect what you believe. That's all James is saying. There is no reference to salvation. To the best of my knowledge in the entire book of James, I believe, it doesn't make reference to the cross of Christ. So James was not telling you how to be saved. He was just telling you, let your works reflect your faith. Show me your faith by your works. So what was the work Israel did to reflect their faith in God? They went out and conquered the promised land. As a matter of fact, the time they refused to do that in Kadesh Benia, the book of Hebrews calls that unbelief and calls their hearts hardened. So they are not moving forward in Kadesh Barnea was an indication they did not believe the gospel that was preached to them. Salvation is exclusively God's work. Grace through faith, not of yourself. A gift of God, lest any should boast. But at the same time, your works would reflect your faith. Your lifestyle cannot be one of a scallywag while you claim to be royalty. How did Joshua himself rise to prominence in the first place? Numbers 13, 23, I believe, himself and Joshua. What did God say about them in that verse? No, it's not 1323. Um, it's likely to be 13. One second. Ah, snap. It's going to be 14, isn't it? Yes, it's going to be 14. Yeah, anyway, their faith spared them. Um, I think thinking about it now, it might actually be the book of Joshua. Where Caleb was talking to Joshua. And explaining... Yeah, here we go. Ah, 
Ah, I knew it was. There we go. It's fourteen twenty-four of numbers, not thirteen twenty-three. Fourteen twenty-four. It says, "But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully." has followed me fully and how did they follow him fully listen to their reports in numbers 14 verse 8 contrary to the other spies if the lord delights in us he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey only do not rebel against the lord nor fear the people of the land for they are our bread their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So how did they fully follow God? By believing what he said. I.e. the gospel that was preached to them. So we can see how faith and works was important or we can see that interplay between faith and works even in the mission of Joshua in bringing them to the promised land. The final point we can glean from Joshua is that there was always more to be done in his promised land endeavor. Joshua 13, verse 1. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. So there was always more to conquer. we will never fully understand the depths of salvation. That's why Paul says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. The word unspeakable there in the Greek, it means that which cannot fully be uttered. Jesus, I believe it's John 17, 3, he said, this is life eternal, that we may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So if Jesus' definition of eternity is knowing God, that means this is life eternal. If Jesus' definition of life eternal, eternal life is knowing God, that means this is an endeavor that will take an eternity. So, just as Joshua's, Joshua still had very much land to conquer, the real promised land, which the real Joshua, Jesus Christ, gives to us, the rest that we ultimately enter into, is one that will take an eternity to unravel. We will never really get to the bottom of it. We would keep being amazed at the new depths we discover. There will always be more to know. There will always be more to understand. There will always be more to grow into. 
there will always be more to grasp to grasp in conclusion Joshua mirrors Jesus in name in mission Joshua's mission was to cause Israel to inherit the promise of God Jesus' mission was also to bring that about to cause us to inherit the promise of God to Abraham it says in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed And finally, there is always more with respect to Joshua's mission. There was always more land to conquer. And in terms of the rest which God gives to us, there will always be more depths to grasp and grow into and understand. I hope you found this insightful. Thank you for listening and see you again in the next episode. Take care.